We are in Romans 9 today. You want to turn in your Bibles there. The verses will be on the screen. Something happens to us when we familiarize ourselves with the glories and the blessings of God's salvation. Everything that we learned in Romans chapter 8, you know, we rejoice because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We know that no condemnation remains, not even a little bit. That we have the Spirit of God living inside of us, and therefore we belong to Christ. We are his adopted sons and daughters. And that we, put, we begin to put all of this together, and, and we rejoice because we know God is for us. He is for you. And because he is for you, no one and nothing can stand against you. That, that we will conquer with success to spare because of him who loved us. We rejoice in that. Do we not, loved ones? We have great cause to rejoice. And yet, such joys should be mingled with deep sorrow, that there is an anguish. When we start talking about those whom God foreknew and predestined and called and justified and glorified, Romans 8, 29 and 30, when we start talking about that, it's mingled with deep sorrows because we know that if we are in Christ, there are also those who cannot say the same. And, and, and that should hurt, maybe more than it does. That, that we know that, that there are others who are not in Christ, and therefore they remain under the just condemnation of God. That there are others who, who do not have the Spirit, that are not led by the Spirit, and therefore are not the sons and daughters of God, and they don't belong to Him. And here's the deal. We, we've come through a section of Scripture where we've talked about who we are in Christ. And if we take the gospel as truth for us, meaning that if we believe we are justified and glorified and God has heaven prepared for everyone and the intercession of Christ will ensure that every redeemed soul will make it there, if we take the gospel as truth, it also means... The opposite is true, that everyone who does not believe is condemned already because they do not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's hell awaiting those who are not in Christ. And that ought to hurt a little bit. Speaking only for myself, I wonder why it doesn't grieve me more. I'm ashamed to admit how calloused I can be when I meet somebody or I have friends, family, that, that I've been differently shaken the dust off of my feet and have put it out of my mind, and it does not grieve me that they do not know the Lord. What we've just described is what Paul is talking about in, in, in Romans chapter 9. It's his attitude toward his fellow Israelites, his countrymen according to the flesh. There's a more deep theology in Romans 9 and 10, talking about sovereign grace and God's choice in the matter. We, we free will Baptists oftentimes forget that God has a choice too. And before we get into all of that, we need to address the emotions of chapter 9 because that's where Paul starts. When, when he looks at his countrymen who rejected the gospel of grace through faith, it burdens his heart. It breaks his heart. It grieves him to his core. And I think we would do well to talk about these emotions that these doctrines elicit. Now, I'm not a touchy-feely kind of guy. You know that. I tend to kind of leave off those touchy-feely emotion sermons, but, but here it's required, and so I beg your leave on that, okay? The text demands that we feel this, and so we need to allow the Holy Spirit 
to lead us to a point where we can feel this. And we sense the emotions here. So let's read the text together. We're in Romans chapter 9. We're going to read down through verse 13 together. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. That he swears, hand on the Bible, calling his conscience and the Holy Spirit to witness against him if he's not telling the truth, that he is a burdened man. Verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So what of Israel? We talked a lot about them at the beginning of our study, like 2, 3, and 4, back, back in those chapters, and how they had pursued God through works of the law and their own righteousness, and, and, and that that's not the way they attain salvation. Paul, Paul uses them as an example. And so what now of them? If Romans chapter 8 talks about God's sovereign activity to save the church, Romans chapter 9 and 10 talks about God's sovereign activity in the remnant of Israel. What about Israel? We read about them here. Look with me at verse 6, and, and we'll, we'll carry on. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also Rebekah, when she conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. We're going to pause there. And you can kind of sense, you know, we're in the deep end of the pool here doctrinally when we read those words. And I know that we stumble over verse 13 because it seems like God, before two children were ever born, rejected one and, and chose the other. And here's the assumption behind that. I'm just going to say this, and we're going to push pause, and we're going to come back to it we're assuming that one of them was worthy and the other one was not. And both of them were unworthy. We just came through the book of Genesis in my men's class on Sunday mornings. Jacob was not worthy of God's choice. There are, In fact, there are some circumstances when if, if you're really comparing and, and you weigh them against each other, Esau might have had more character than Jacob. Maybe. And we're assuming that when we read that, somehow Jacob deserved it and Esau didn't, and God rejected Esau and chose Jacob. And that's not the case. God chose according to the purpose of his own election, not by works, but by his own sovereign will. That God chose in grace an unworthy individual to use to build his kingdom and to bring Christ into the world. Now, that has some ramifications for salvation, does it not? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but we are not worthy of God's choice. We are not. And somewhere along the line, we might start thinking that we are and that others aren't, and that's why God chose us, and that's not how God chooses. God chooses in grace according to his own purpose and election. God chooses. Now, pause. We'll circle back around to that next week, okay? We need to go back to the emotions of the text because Paul says some very strong things, that he has deep sorrow, unceasing, unceasing anguish in his heart for his countrymen 
according to the flesh because they have, have all of this history and all of these blessings and somehow they missed Christ. Somehow they, the, the gospel did not take root in them. And that breaks his heart. And so here's what we need to do this morning. That we need to allow the Holy Spirit to bring us into his thought process. If we're going to understand the, the deep joys and how they're mingled with deep sorrows, then, then we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into the same kind of thought process that Paul has here. Now, let's go back and, and look at the text in verses 4 and 5. Okay, What does Paul say in verses 4 and 5? That he, that he knows who they are, Israel, because he's one of them. He's identifying with them. Now, can we just take a minute and think about their history for a second? Because this is kind of an abbreviated but complete view of who they are according to God's choice of the nation of Israel. But when we read through the Old Testament, the vacillating, double-minded, back and forth is exhausting, isn't it? I mean, uh, they're on the mountaintop in one generation, and they're in the absolute rock-bottom valley the next generation. I mean, you read through the book of Judges, and it's up and down the whole way. It gives you a headache by the time you're done with it. That, that there is quailing unbelief in their history, and that frustrates us. Like, when you read through the Exodus, and, and God just marched them through the Red Sea on dry ground... And they get to the other side, and in a couple of days they start complaining because they're thirsty? Like, that is just, like, I don't get that kind of unbelief. And, and all the while, they're questioning God's presence among them when he's leading them by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And yet, where are they going to get food? God let us out here to starve. We wish we could go back to Egypt, where we had full pots of meat and all the vegetables we wanted to eat. It was like Golden Corral. When that was not the case, they were slaves, right? That, that kind of unbelief I don't get until I look myself in the mirror. And, and then when we get to the New Testament and we read through the Gospels, their hard-heartedness toward Christ is maddening. Isn't it? It's it, miracle after miracle. And, and, and Jesus said, look, if you, don't, if you don't believe me for my sake, believe me for the, the miracle's sake. Look at what I'm doing. And they, they just hardened their hearts and refused to accept. And that is, sometimes that's just too much for me to take in until I look myself in the mirror. And yet, with all of that, when we think about their history and, and, and what they did to Christ, it should not be forgotten. We should not forget, as the church, that they, as a nation, were loved and chosen by God. And that the text enumerates many blessings that God had given to Israel. Look back there with me at the text. First, they were privileged to be descendants of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That that in and of itself was a blessing that no other nation bore. And beyond their patriarchal ancestry, the Jews were privileged to be adopted. Same kind of language that God uses for the church in chapter 8, that, that, that we have the Holy Spirit and are adopted sons and daughters of God, that the nation of Israel were, were also his adopted sons and daughters. Notice with me, if you're counting third, in a unique way, God's own presence dwelt in the midst of them. We've, we mentioned the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, but when the tabernacle was built, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. When the temple was built, God dwelt. That his manifest presence, his glory dwelled there in that place of worship, and that was a unique privilege that they had. Nowhere else on earth did that take place. That belonged to them. Above all nations, they had been given the covenants, unbake, unbreakable, unbreakable promises made by God to them. Above all other nations, they had received those unbreakable promises. Alongside those covenants, God had gave them his law. God gave them his law, the Ten Commandments. And 
the hundreds of other laws that went along with them. And with that came the temple service and worship that, that you, you can kind of begin to see just how blessed they are. Let's say that in a present tense. And, and we know that right now they, they're kind of disenfranchised, that there is no temple, and that, that many Jewish people, according to their descent, are atheistic or agnostic. They're very secular. They're not who they once were, but that does not mean the word of God has failed. You know that? And, and, and by the way, when we're still counting their blessings, by far their greatest blessing from which all others find their greatest and truest meaning is the fact that through them, Christ came into the world. From them and through them, God would bring Messiah into the world to save his people from their sins. And so Paul says, I know you because I'm one of you. His own testimony, Philippians chapter 3, was this, that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. He, he, he knew who they were because he was one of them. And that, that's important, that we maintain that connection with people who we know do not share in the same blessings that we share in. That when we look at our family, that we maintain some sense of identification, right? We know them because we're one of them. When we look at our friends, we have relationship. Our neighbors, we live in the same neighborhood. Our coworkers, we work for the same place. We have this connection that brings us together. We're not against you. We're for you for the sake of the gospel, right? And that's why Paul's saying all of this reminding them of who they are, and so he knows who they are because he's one of them, and yet, because he knows who Jesus is, he also knows that their trust is misplaced. We spent a lot of time talking about this in chapters 2 through 4, but let's just quickly summarize everything that we talked about. They rested in their history, right? Even according to this text. They trusted in things like their genealogy, their family tree, their history as a nation and their activity, their works, what they could do for God instead of what God has done for them and, and, and trusting in his promise to them. You understand those things are two totally different things, right? They were, they were trusting in what they could do for God instead of resting in God's promise to them and what God had done for them on their behalf. And, and, and yet, they failed to respond to the gospel they missed Christ altogether, generally speaking, right? There, there were individuals who, who found him. You know, we, we know people believe, but generally speaking, they missed Christ. But as I said a moment ago, that does not mean, not for a second, that the word of God has failed or that somehow it's of no account. That, that his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rocks in pieces. That it's just like the rain and the snow, Isaiah 55, that comes down from heaven, that waters the earth and gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be, saith the Lord. It will accomplish the very thing to which I sent it. And so, instead, this rejection was an example of a previously stated truth. We go back to chapter 2 and verse 29. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit and not the letter. And, and so what, what, what Paul is saying there is the same thing that he is saying here. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. It's not a matter of genetic descent. It's not a matter of nationality. It's not even a matter of citizenship. It's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. So the, the people who believe and trust in the promise are true descendants of Abraham because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Agreed? And so, so this reveals some things to us, that, that their rejection, we've already covered that, reveals that a Jew is one inwardly, and it's a matter of the heart. And it also reveals something that we commented on as we were reading the text, God's sovereign dealing with Israel. 
it, it, we, we know that God is sovereign over the church. We've seen that clearly in chapter 8, have we not? But we need to understand that God is also sovereign over Israel and remains to be so. And, and this, when we start treading water in the deep end of this theological pool, it demands more than a superficial understanding. It must carefully be considered. We have to drill down here. It requires our best effort to receive and understand it. And when we become ever mindful of God's unambiguous and, and unrestricted and, and unthreatened sovereign power in salvation, we are left with some profound mis- mysteries, especially when it comes to the nation of Israel. What is God going to do with them? Because they're the people of promise. Through them came Messiah. God made unbreakable covenants to them. And because of their rejection, what, what is he going to do with them? Because to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the worship and the promises, the sovereign Lord will not repudiate or in any way invalidate the fulfillment of his promises to them. You know how I know that? Because he won't do it to the church either. And you need to understand something. And I want you to look at me and and hear me on this with regard to the nation of Israel. If God could somehow invalidate those unbreakable promises that he made to them by covenant and somehow repudiate them as his chosen people in the Old Testament, then God could do that to you even though you're in Christ. You understand? If God could break that promise, then no promise is sacred. Agreed? And so we have to come together on this. And when we look at their rejection We understand what God is doing, that God is chastening them and disciplining them and even punishing them, and that those are elements of God's faithfulness to them as his covenant people. That God disciplines and receives every son whom he receives. That God chastens those whom he loves. And that's that's consistent with his nature as our good father. And so cutting Israel off for their unbelief is perfectly consistent with his covenant because it's the children of promise, those who believe that are counted as offspring. So he knows who they are, and yet he also knows who Jesus is, and he realizes that their trust is misplaced, that they're going about this all wrong. I mean, they're trusting in their history and their past blessing, and they're trusting in their, their genealogy, their family tree, and they're trusting in their own activities and what, what they could do for God, and they're going on about it all wrong, and this breaks his heart. Verses 1 through 3. And I know we, we kind of covered the rest of it, but look, look at what he says again with me in verses 2 and 3 in particular. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And we commented on this as we were reading it, but he swears. he's, he's, He's making a promise, hand on the Bible, to God, calling to witness the Holy Spirit against him if he is lying, that he is a burdened man for the people of Israel. That, that everything he said, pointing out their flaws and, and their the, 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 the error in their ways, does not mean that he does not care about them or that what they have done does not break his heart, that he has a constant sense of grief. And that, think with me about it. His own testimony in Romans chapter 7, that he's been delivered through Jesus Christ from the body of death. That, that he himself bears no condemnation. But his countrymen, his fellow Israelites, his brothers and sisters according to the flesh, refuse the gospel of grace through faith. So he lives in constant pain and continual grief over their soul. Now this has me thinking. I've done some soul searching about my own response to the fact that I have family who happen to be good people. I happen to like being around them very much. But they are not in Christ. 
wonder why it doesn't bother me more. That I have friends whom I care about deeply, who I enjoy common interests with, who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them and therefore do not belong to him. How does that reality make me feel? Because if, if I were honest, most of the time I don't feel anything. Most of the time I'm just trying to put one foot in front of the other and I haven't really given it a second thought. Most of the time I'm too busy with my own aches and pains and my own griefs to be burdened about them. And could we not, since there is a sense of nationalism here, say the same thing about our country? And everything that is going on in our world right now, that, that Paul looks at Israel's history and their past blessing in light of where they are now, and, and even that breaks his heart. And, and could we not say the same thing about America? That, that we look at our, our past, and, and, and while acknowledging past mistakes, that we can look at our past and look at our past blessing and where we once were and where we are now and grieve over it? We should. It ought to feel like a funeral sometimes. Can, can we not look at the state of affairs right now and, and realize that there are present sins that need to be repented of and, 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 and still, w without creating this us versus them, maintain some kind of connection to the point of, of it being painful and causing us to grieve? I think so. So it happens on two fronts. I think we can look at it culturally as Americans, but we also need to play this a little closer to, to home and to the chest, and we need to look at, look at our family, our friends, those in close proximity, our neighbors and our coworkers, and, and how does the reality that comes from knowing Christ and realizing that they do not, how does that make us feel? It ought to hurt. And so we need to ask ourselves some searching questions here. And I've got, I've got three of them for you, and we'll be done, okay? Do, this is what I've asked myself this week. Do I have great sorrow? I want you to ask it right now. Do I have great sorrow for those who are not in Christ? Great sorrow is like a continual, ever-mounting sense of grief. Day by day, it gets worse, more intense, more acute. In particular for Paul, as he felt the loss of his countrymen, that, that he was grieving continually, and that grief got worse and worse day by day as he sensed their loss. And, and it occurs to me that we've never really given ourselves permission to feel the eternal loss of those we know, but who are not in Christ. And maybe I'm just speaking for myself. But I need to. And I think we all need to give ourselves permission to feel that sense of loss. Right now, feel it. That, that we know we'll feel it at the graveside. We know we'll feel it then, but then it's too late. We need to feel it now. And that, in, that instead of growing calloused toward it, that, that in some ways we ought to sense it like we're presently standing at the graveside, that it ought to feel as if we're at a funeral and that we are mourning their loss. Do we have great sorrow for those who are not in Christ? You understand what's at stake, do you not? If we take the gospel as truth, then Heaven is our reward. It is truly gain for us to die, but that is not true for those who are not in Christ. Do we have unceasing anguish for those who do not have the Holy Spirit and thus are not a part of God's family? This unceasing anguish is uninterrupted pain. I've had plenty of physical injuries in my life that have caused me a great amount of pain. My back 
has hurt for the last couple of days, and I'm just extremely uncomfortable all the time. I have some emotional ones, too. I think those are worse. They last longer anyway. Wouldn't you agree? There's a lot of things that cause us pain in this life. You know what's true about me? I believe it's true about you, too. I don't like to hurt. Do you? You like pain? I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't like it so much that I'll go to great lengths to avoid it altogether. Like if something's going to fall on me, guess what? I'm going to get out of the way, you know? We're going we're to do whatever we can to avoid it. And, and that's not just true physically. It's true emotionally that, that we put walls up emotionally and we're not emotionally honest with people about how we feel because we don't want to get hurt. It's also true spiritually. It is, loved ones. And we ignore the potential pain of losing a loved one forever. And we're not just talking about death here. We're talking about separation forever. We ignore that because we don't want to feel it. That we've so programmed ourselves to put pain aside and not deal with it, not face it, not feel it. that We ignore it. Could it be that we've walled ourselves in spiritually? And that, that we might have even callously hardened our hearts to those who do not enjoy the same blessings that we do because it's just easier not to feel. Confession time again, I think that's true for me. I think maybe I've been disappointed one too many times and it's just easier not to feel. I've been rejected one too many times. And I don't want to face that again, and so it's just easier not to feel it. And so I, to my own shame, ignore it. Do we have great sorrow for those who are not in Christ? Do we have unceasing anguish for those who are not a part of God's family? And then thirdly, would I take their place in judgment so they could know him? hard one. Paul felt so deeply for his people Israel that if his separation from Christ could somehow affect their inclusion, he was willing to do that. That if his punishment would somehow bring about their forgiveness, he would lay his life down willingly for them. Even Jesus said something to that effect. That no greater love had a man, any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And this is the honest expression of Paul's heart. Now, we know that, that he could not die for their atonement. He didn't have to. Only Christ could do that. But his willingness to sacrifice himself is just the honest emotion of his heart. He was willing to lay his life down so that they could come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to us, we know that we can't die to save people. You, you know that, right? That you can't atone for somebody else's sins. You don't have to. Christ did that for them and for you. But we can, as I've already said, willingly sacrifice ourselves and lay our lives down so that others can come to know Christ as we have. So here's what that means. You know, if, we're, if we're searching for, for some application here, that means if, if we're going to do this, if, we, if we're going to sense the sorrow and the pain and, and be willing to lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel, then we've got to be willing to do some things to make that count and make that stick. We could spend less so that we have more to give. And not just to our church, but those missionaries that we just talked about a few minutes ago, you know, they're trying to make a go of it in a foreign land, and that costs money. And so we could be willing to spend less so that we had more to give. I'm in your business now, aren't I? 
we could worry less about being accepted and place more importance on eternity. That hits a little close to home because I, I like being liked. Don't you? We worry less about being accepted because God is for us. Who can be against us? And we are more than conquerors through, his, through him that loved us and place more importance on eternity. We, we could invest our lives in discipleship rather than coming to church to consume or to be served with a what have you done for me lately mentality. We could realize that our place in the body, God has done that as it seems good to him and that he's given you a spiritual gift and me a spiritual gift and everyone that he has placed in his body by the spirit, a spiritual gift for the common good and that the body for it to function properly, needs you to use your gift instead of other people using their gifts to serve you. Does that make sense? That we could invest our lives in, in, in discipleship instead of coming to, to, to consume and to be served. We could even be willing to go if God called. And that the willingness to go begins with open ears that are listening for the Father's voice. I think that's where we're, when we start talking about laying our lives down for the sake of the gospel, we automatically go here. We bypass all the other stuff in between. We bypass all the other necessary incremental obedience, and we think somehow we're going to end up in Africa somewhere or in 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 a country that's in the middle of a, a strict lockdown for the pandemic with no opportunity to get home. and You understand what I'm saying? We bypass all of that and get here and when we think of the extreme. But you know that God still does the extreme. Otherwise, there wouldn't be Josh and Lydia Provo with their kids in Bulgaria or David and Mimi Reeves who are trying desperately to get back to France because that's where their heart is. Because God's called them there. And they've laid their lives down to go. God still does the extreme. And he just might, he just might be calling you to go. But we're not listening. Because we're afraid of what that might mean. But if we're going to sense the emotion of this and feel it, if we're not just trying to bring self-hurt. We're not just trying to sense the grief and the sorrow. We really want to bring ourselves to a place where we're listening. That it has God's greater purpose in that our ears are opened and we are listening and that faith increases and we're willing to lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel. And it starts, I think, with that incremental obedience. We start by putting our money where our mouth is and that we crucify ourselves. And having died to ourselves, we're not really worried about what people think of us. We just want them to enjoy the same blessings that we do. And, and that if we're going to invest our talent and our treasures and our time, our energy and our spiritual giftedness all of the things that God has trusted us with as stewards into making disciples, and we're going to play the long game. That we're going to get in and we're going to stick it out and we're going to endure through the ups and the downs, the hurts and the pains, so that we can have the joys at the end. And when it comes to it, if God calls, we're going to go. We're going to go. So as we close and we bring this to a head, I want you to give yourself permission to feel. To feel the loss of that, that person you've been thinking about this whole time. And you see their face. You think about your relationship with them. And I want you to give yourself permission to feel the loss of their soul. 
so that your heart may be broken. It should hurt. Even if it's just, it should hurt. And if it doesn't, we need to repent. Don't we? That, that somehow along the line, we have left off our first love. So we need to remember from where we've fallen and repent. And if it does, if you give yourself permission to feel and it breaks your heart, then let's commit to do something about it. Let's, let's begin right now by committing to do something about it. That we're going to give less, or, or excuse me, spend less so that we can give more. We're not going to worry about our own acceptance but people's eternal souls. But we're going to invest instead of consume. And when it comes time, we'll go. Let's pray together. Father, help us. Holy Spirit, help us to yield our wills to yours. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to understand what you have said to us. And that you would give us a holy permission to feel, as Paul did, the weight of loss for his countrymen. And that as we look in our minds at the faces of our friends and our family and our co-workers and our neighbors, that you would help us to sense that loss even now and that our hearts would break. And that we would commit in that brokenness to do something about it. Father, if it does not break our heart, forgive us Help us to repent. That we would abandon that behavior. And that you would change us. That you would give us your heart and your eyes to see. In Jesus' name.